Hi everyone. A few days ago, my publisher, through uh, the promotions person and publicist Samantha Fitzpatrick, asked me if I would be interested in giving a talk on Gothic literature. Uh, presumably, in large part, because well, that's that's where my um, academic prowess is, I suppose you might call it. Uh, but also that my upcoming novel, The Hush Sisters, coming out in September, is described by myself as a gothic novel. So I need to talk to you about what that means, I suppose, and uh, my own background. Uh, but I think based on the few questions that people have sent me uh, in advance of me doing this talk, uh, you're interested in knowing exactly what it is and how it influences my own writing. So uh, I'll get right into it. This is not going to be a lecture style. Uh, even when I lecture, I don't really lecture. I like to just talk. And in my true style, I've done tons and tons and tons of research to remind myself of what it is I want to talk about. And I usually just end up just talking and see what comes out. So um, if you were to look up the term Gothic on the internet, what you would find are a lot of different definitions of what it really is. And I'm not going to pretend that I have the definitive definition, but I will say that I, I guess I'm emotionally attached to the subject, so I... I I tend to uh, take uh, some offense, I suppose you might call it, uh, take umbrage with the idea that there, the Gothic is tied up in ideas of what it was 300, 200 years ago, or even 100 years ago. Like anything else, the idea is evolving. As a couple of you said to me in, in notes that you sent me, well, my idea of the Gothic is uh, connected with European castles of the 18th century, which is fair enough, and, I, and a lot of the material I found online said exactly that. But that is not exactly where my interest in the genre um, rests, or lies, or dies, or stops. Um, and to me, the Gothic, uh, number one, it has evolved in, in, in its idea, unlike uh, apparently a lot of people's idea of what it is. Uh, you could call what exists now maybe a neo-gothic or a postmodern gothic or a modern gothic, whatever you want. Uh, gothic itself, uh, the, the term, uh, and most people associated with architecture of uh, the 16th, uh, 17th, 16th century, there's sort of a, a renaissance of sorts of, of gothic literature. This, usually it's it's large spacious areas with uh, tunnels underneath, uh, spires that, that twist in a sort of strange looking sort of way and reach towards the sky. Uh, we see it now in cathedrals, for example. It's still a lot of that architecture still exists. And it fills you with a sort of a, a sense of wonder. Uh, words like wonder and sublime are really associated with, with the effects of the Gothic. Um, Gothic, uh, coming from, from, um, a nomadic tribe that uh, essentially drove the Romans out of Europe uh, and, and in a sense, conquered Rome itself uh, by... Uh, and, and, and this, I guess, when you go back, to, that's 3rd, 4th century, and you're looking at, first of all, it's a nomadic tribe, and you're looking at a very anti-establishment, uh, uh, anti-monolithic type of people. Um, and I, most of the definitions I read, and most of the, um, even most of the historians, even though they'll describe the Goths, they don't make this connection between what the Goths were uh, as a nomadic tribe, especially, and an anti-establishment, and so on, uh, and, and rather heroic in their own way, although then they became the monolith, of course, which is inevitable. And that's part of the lesson, of course, which we see in uh, the Scottish play, for example, by Shakespeare. Um, see how I, there's so many arms and legs and heads to this idea of what Gothic is. And I just, I'm looking in my, uh, my, uh, camera right away. I didn't realize that I, my beard is rather Harrison Fordish, and I've let it grow out intentionally because I didn't want to give a false impression of what's happening during this pandemic and that I'm just kind of letting myself go, <laughs> letting myself grow as, as, as I like to call it. Um, and there's sort of a wildness, I guess, about not just the beard, but, about the Gothic literature in itself. Uh, so with those roots in anti-establishment and 
and nomadic. It's it and, and being a nomadic tribe, which the Goths were. It's no wonder that the literature we associate not so much with them. It's really disconnected from those people, but um, it just seems to me that it's perfect because the Gothic itself. Uh, it defies genre, it defies ideas of definition even. It has a lot of qualities, you might say. One of those qualities, um, and, and again, I, I do I consider myself a gothic writer? Uh, I, I guess if I had to, but, uh, but I kind of def like to defy labels too. I'm a literary writer, uh, I suppose more than anything, but, it, but there are elements of gothic to my writing, which I mean, I'll get, I'll get to talking about that. Gothic fiction, Gothic literature, to me, uh, it is anti-establishment. Whether that's anti-church, uh, and, and anti-capitalist, especially today, but I think it always has been both of those things. And as I said, anti-monolithic. So, a monolithic in 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 sense of the, the the inherited or or the predominant narratives of the day. So, and I'm going to try not to sound too academic when I talk about this. Um, and the way to do that, of course, is to tie it to the everyday. To me, the Gothic, or the Gothic style, or uh, the Gothic fiction, whatever you want to call it, it it borrows from the everyday, um, and it shows you an alternative of that everyday. And and quite often, that alternative uh, exploits our own fears about the present or about the future, and quite often trading in on a repression of a past which might return and rise up and make the present and the future more difficult for you in some ways or darker or uh, even more sinister um, th this and you know I'll, I'll be taking a lot of asides um, but you know I mean it, it, this is the perfect genre I suppose for the times we live in for and for this very moment in, in history um, which um, which has got got the entire world in its grip, this global pandemic, um, and and I don't want to exploit that idea, but it occurs to me in talking about there's an isolationist quality about Gothic literature, it's a claustrophobic feeling, uh, and that usually has the effect of ramping up emotions, and those can be good emotions or it can be bad emotions that create great feelings of love and family and romance and nine months later children are born or it can create it can ramp up those feelings of fear resentment discontentment um and and then there's the worry about um how long will this last for how much is it going to change our lives it's already disrupted our lives quite a bit um it'd be interesting to know maybe that uh, Mary Shelley, uh, who wrote probably the quintessential Gothic novel in 1818, it was published when, when she was just a teenager, uh, she also wrote a novel called The Last Man, which is about a global pandemic that wipes out the entire Earth's population except for one man. And this pandemic takes place in the 21st century, early 21st century, I should add. So most people see Mary Shelley as being prescient in terms of Frankenstein's uh, um, questions about where science run amok is, is going to lead us, uh, and, and among other things. But so, to me, the Gothic, um, it can be prescient in that way because it, ta it, it focuses very much on what is. Now, at the time that she wrote her novel, um, there was this... Uh, ongoing search for a Northwest Passage, for example. So there was, there were, there were, there just seemed to be this explosion of boundaries to, to search for more and more what, what, what people, what, what humankind was capable of doing. And, and what it's capable of doing is great good as well as great harm. So that's, that's one way of, of uh, looking at the Gothic. It, it, it turns a mirror on our society and, and quite often that mirror is dark. You know, it's the idea of through a glass darkly. I would look at something like Alice in Wonderland as having a great gothic quality as well as a fantas fantastical quality as well. It turns the mirror on our society. So it's anti-establishment, it's anti-current anti narrative, anti-monolithic you might say. 
Uh, it is deeply critical of, of normal society or of normalcy itself. Uh, it is, it, it, it reflects our own fears back at us. The things that when we look out into the world that we see that might be a little weird or eccentric, that can include people as well as buildings. Um, if, if, you, if you think of a house as haunted, um, the, the question arises, is it, is it a house that was born haunted? It wasn't made that way or did it become haunted? Uh, if there are ghosts, for example, where do those ghosts come from? Most times they come from human beings. Uh, we, we create our own monsters. Um, and that essentially, almost quintessentially, is what Gothic, I will keep saying what it's all about, but really it's all about a lot of things. Um, the, the, the monsters that Gothic, and I'll use the word monsters in quotation marks because the idea has evolved so I'll take you back a little bit. The first gothic novel was Horace Walpole's The Castle of Otranto. And this is essentially a ghost story. He even called it a, 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 a gothic novel uh, in the subtitle. And uh, it, was, it was meant to, to, it had castles, it had subterranean caverns, it had ghosts, it had the supernatural, it had fear, suspense, all of those things. And, um, but there was a tongue-in-cheek quality about it. I mean, if you think about a lot of Edgar Allan Poe's stuff in the um, mid-1800s, it too had a lot of tongue-in-cheek, ironic quality about it, as if, as if the writer himself was laughing at us and sort of playing this mischievous god who, by, just by telling us a story, was freaking us out. And that, that's, again, part of what the Gothic traditionally has done. And even with those early stories, I think of Anne Radcliffe, who wrote something like The Italian, which, which uh, it, it's, it's actually one of my favorite Gothic works, except uh, she, she did a lot of research and she used it all in the book. It's a very long book. And, uh, or The Monk by Matthew Lewis, who was actually nicknamed Monk, Monk Lewis. Uh, they wrote about uh, Catholicism in particular, uh, by foreign lands. And the monsters generally came from, from elsewhere. Uh, the Italian, for example, is set in Italy, uh, and Radcliffe herself was, was English. And the idea, of course, it was safe Gothic in the sense that there, were, there are monsters out there, there are creatures, there are others in the world who might harm us if we allow them in, They're sort of barbarians at the gate sort of idea. Uh, but we shan't let them in, shall we? We'll, we'll lock the door at the end of the novel and, and just reassure the reader that everything is fine if that's possible to do. Um, and just to do a sort of quick survey after, you know, Anne Radcliffe had a great influence on, on just about everybody who came after her uh, in, in, within the genre. Matthew Lewis, I mean, he wrote about monks and, and beautiful female singers who uh, became, who fell prey to, to the um, obsession of you know characters within the church, persons within the church, and so on. So the church was not considered to be. Uh, it was one. It was one of those monoliths that that uh, the the Gothicists traditionally and to this day probably uh, rather despise. And it's capitalism and so on, and the, the whole money making adventure, the, the necessity for earning a living, and and exploiting people for for monetary gain, etc. Um, so a after, after those two in the 18th century, I could easily skip ahead to people like, uh, Wuthering Heights by, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, Wuthering Heights and Jane Eyre by, by, um, uh, Emily and Cheryl Bronte, respectively. Um, those are considered to be Gothic novels, but a lot of people don't realize they're considered Gothic novels. It's, part it's partly because they've got this sort of it's not just the weirdness. It's not just the darkness. The darkness is part of it. It's, it's the, the feeling like... I remember the scene in Wuthering Heights where the narrator uh, is awakened in the middle of the night through a storm. He can't sleep. He's staying in a strange place, which is you know, strange in a strange land. That, that, that's, that's part of this whole thing, too. And the ghost of Catherine... You know, you know Catherine Heathcliff, you probably have heard of them... Uh, who is, she's the sort of return of the repressed and, and she, her arm breaks through a window or at least that's what he dreams happens. And 
I think that's the quintessential moment for Gothic because there's this thin memory, membrane between the everyday reality in which we live and this alternate reality that is just out of reach or just out of sound or just out of touch, but it's there. And all you have to do is open your eyes, squint, look at it, open your mind, or happen upon it accidentally one day, and there it is right in front of you. And your life can really never be the same after that. And, and that's, that's a genuine fear. I think of this pandemic in the same way, that it's, it's one of those things that it's always been there. You know, it, uh, Stephen King's The Stand, uh, which is part gothic, part horror. Um, in that novel, the, the pandemic that, that wipes out much of humanity uh, stems from, originates in a lab in the southern United States. Um, but all gothic had it that you know, those things happen far, far away. And that's essentially what happened this time, that it began in a, in a country far, far away from the Western world. But if you live in China, it didn't happen far, far away. If you live in Italy, it didn't happen far, far away. It happened in, you know, in and near those places. So where am I going with this? Um, the idea tra is traditionally that the monster is out there and it's, and it's, and it's coming for us. It's, it's coming to get us. And that it will change our lives irreparably and it will make us see the world through a different lens. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. But there's a subversive quality to the Gothic. I look at, um, I'll use another example like Stephen King's The Shining, where you have a normal English teacher, if there is such a thing, who was a writer, uh, a failed writer, and he takes his family up into the mountains, into Colorado, and to become a caretaker at this uh, sort of castle-like hotel for the winter. What could go wrong, right? Well. Things go, get strange pretty quickly, and they have a son who has the shine, who's the ability to not only uh, see into people's minds, to communicate with his mind uh, without speaking, but to see into other dimensions. He, he, he sees past and through this thin membrane between every day and the other world. And so I, I think uh, Stephen King in that novel, he, he's, he's t saying a lot about a lot. Uh, Mostly, I think he's he's suggesting how close we all are to having those insane moments, like those not sane moments, those moments when reason uh, is nowhere to be found, where reason and logic flees from us. The and by the by the thin veil of society, I mean the uh, Joyce Carol Oates writes about this uh, quite quite well, actually, in some of her short stories, especially how the only reason why we are safe and feel safe in our world is because we have uh, a social contract that if we close our doors and lock them or we keep our windows barred, then nobody and nothing is going to harm us. But more and more with a sort of modern or neo-Gothic or postmodern Gothic, the so-called monster comes from within. But also we will find, and you will find, quite often the so-called monster, uh, the cliche is the monster is us. It's not just a cliche, it's probably true we create our own fears. I mean, the post stories talked about this a lot. And um, so the monster, um, again, quote, in quotation marks, uh, is not really a monster. More and more in this postmodern world, we recognize that the monster is simply that which we have considered to be other, which is maybe different from us, but there is also some similarity to us. That, uh, and also, if 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 there are monsters that are created within our within our world, serial killers, for example, um, um, all sorts of bad things. Uh, Flannery O'Connor again was another. I consider her to be a Southern Gothicist. She shows us. We create those those monsters. We can try and uh, separate ourselves from them. We can try and uh, dis disconnect, disassociate, uh, disown, which she which she shows at the end of a good good man is hard to find, uh, or to own. And if we're doing it right, we own those monsters. We we recognize that it's not just them. It's not just us. It's not just their families. It's not just our families. It's 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 our institutions. It's it's our 
it's our sort of there's a sort of conservatism against which the Gothic reacts, which shouldn't surprise you, I suppose. Uh, this desire to have things stay the same and yet simultaneous normal human desire for something different, something new. And sometimes, as in the monkey's paw, I, I keep tossing these names in there, just maybe ring a bell for you. Uh, sometimes, as the cliche goes, emanating from the monkey's paw, you know, be careful what you wish for. And so change comes sometimes in a pretty dark, twisted, uh, destabilizing form. And the destabilization, the questioning of norms, the anti-establishment quality, the, the, and, and, all, and, and in particular, the wanting to leave the, um, the effect outside the pages of the novel or outside the uh, theater where you've just seen a Tim Burton movie like Edward Scissorhands, for example, uh, where the so-called monster lives just down the road and we come to realize that, hey, he's not really a monster. We kind of are, and we made him. We made him what he is because he, he becomes exactly what we, our expectations are of him. Uh, and he reacts to that, and we react, and so on. Um, so, in talking about my, I'm only going to go on for maybe another three, four minutes here. But my own, my own work uh, has been quite dark. The darkness is a part of the Gothic. Um, the, I do borrow, I guess, on the haunted houses of things like uh, Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House or Stephen King's The Shining, the, 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 the hotel, um, the house where the governess stays in the turn of the screw, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, Neil Gaiman's uh, The Ocean at the End of the Lane, uh, I consider to be one of the great gothicists of our time. Um, and, and in my own writing, I find uh, I don't start out to be gothic. I'm not, I don't st st stick to a set of rules and guidelines because I want to, want to be gothic. Gothic tends to be suspenseful uh, in, in my, and generally quite literary in the sense of the fineness of its writing. And by fine, I don't mean better than. Sometimes maybe I do mean that, I suppose. But I mean, in terms of it, it it's a little bit more nuanced. It's got more subtext. Um, the story beneath the story, which is gothic, gothic night, uh, idea in itself, because you have these, again, subterranean caverns and, and hallways and, and hidden passages and so on. So, yeah, you, you can have suspense. And it generally, that feeling of destabilization leaves the pages, leaves the theater, and it goes with you, and it makes you see your world in a different way. Or maybe just in a way that reflects what you already thought was possible, but feared was possible, and now think really is possible. If And I think nobody's gotten the, more right than Edgar Allan Poe with his idea that, that, that Gothic really is all about effect, brevity and effect. Um, and that the idea is that you, you haunt the soul of the reader. Uh, but I, I'm not sure you can haunt the soul of a reader that isn't already haunted. You can, you can affect it, or affect it, and affect it too. Uh, you, you, can, you can cause them to see, cause them to feel, you know, heightened emotions. That's part of what the Gothic is about. Uh, but I think if you're doing it really, really well, you cause them to remember their own questioning, remember their own fears and so on. And this is why quite often Gothic is about the so-called return of the repressed. It's, it's, the, it's the fear that the past can visit upon the present, that the thing that's hidden, the secret, the secret shame can rise up and can ruin your present and ruin your future and life really truly will never be the same. Um, I'm not sure I've gotten to the heart of what Gothic really is. You know, I, and I spent a lot of years studying, well over a decade, I think, between masters and, and, or close to a decade, at least, between my masters degree and my PhD. This is what I studied. And, it's, and essentially, this is sort of what it comes down to, is anti-establishment. It, it's destabilizing. Uh, but it's not horror, and I, I guess I maybe will sort of leave with this idea, uh, and, this, and this, is, this is part of my own sensibility. I, somebody who started out many years ago wanting to be the next Stephen King, 
the so-called master of horror, who to my mind writes a lot of gothic and horror. Horror is more of the body. It's more, it's, it's, it's really sort of done without, without a heart, a mind, or a soul. It's bludgeoning. It's uh, horror, really, the effect is simply to horrify you, to, to shock you, to, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of dismemberment and decay and um, um, blood, I think. That's that, and, and it can be of the mind too, of course. It can be shocking of the mind. Some of the great horror, like Clive Barker, was really good. At, is really good at that. Uh, Stephen King can be too. There's a bludgeoning sort of quality to that. But gothic to me is not about that. It's not about the bloodletting. It's more about the suspense that takes place before the possible bloodletting. And I'll use bloodletting as a as a euphemism for simply fear or and, and I don't mean fear I mean destabilization I mean strangeness and that and that to me is the gothic so my own work there's a there's a darkness to all of it uh, moonlight sketches I don't consider that to be gothic it's dark but not gothic Fintan Moon had all the trappings I think the the sort of the old house, but it wasn't a haunted house necessarily. Even a little bungalow that Fenton Moon lived in had a dark quality about it because of the people who lived there. Um, and there was a sense of the other, of course, but there was also the scrutinizing of the everyday and the fear of what might be. Um, the, the Hush Sisters, the novel I have coming out in the fall, I, de I describe that as a gothic novel. And so, it's pro I'll probably find myself talking about this, this a fair bit over the next few months, uh, like in terms of you know, um, talking to media or at festivals and things like that. But essentially, it's a destabilizing novel. Um, it's not even that it's intended to destabilize. It's just me doing my usual thing of looking at the world around me and seeing something slightly different from what other people see, but not because it's not there, but because it is there. And, and most times we try and keep that at bay. And this novel represents that idea of trying to keep the worst fears, trying to keep the family history, trying to keep the stories, uh, and, and to, to keep it all from overwhelming you. And, and that sense of claustrophobia is, it, is embedded within the novel. Uh, and that's, that's another lesson I learned from Edgar Allan Poe, uh, to keep it simple. And so I, I, I do that because it, 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 it sets the focus, and put, it sets the, the, the camera, so to speak, upon just a few individuals in a singular setting that is exceptionally dark. Uh, but that doesn't mean there isn't lightness. That doesn't mean that there isn't a sort of dance macabre uh, of you know, the, 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 the laughter uh, from the clown. In this case, the clown itself is, is the genre, is, is literature. It is the thing which, it's that haunted house that stands in the middle of a neighborhood that you pass by every day. And you sort of get a, you start, start to wonder who's watching you from that window? Who has lived in that house? What have they done? Why don't they ever come outside? It's the Boo Radley uh, gothicization. The fear of contamination, the fear that that house is going to infect the rest of us. You know, the, the nice, pleasant urban neighborhood or even rural neighborhood I suppose but yeah the fear the fear of contagion of catching whatever it's got and whatever it's got it's pretty bad and it's pretty dark and that's true not only of houses but of people themselves and that's about as close as I'm going to get to scratching that itch that goth itch um that's the the punny, the, the punny part of me comes out inevitably. So I hope this hasn't been too serious. It feels like it is, but I'm trying. I'm just trying to explain something that I feel in my heart and soul. And there is so much more. I, I, I feel like this is going to be a half hour video. I feel like it could easily be you know, several hours to be to be continued. I hope you have somewhat of a better idea of what the Gothic is and what it isn't, how it started, how it came to be, what it is. And, and why it's essentially what I write, but not what I feel uh, I always write. Um, gothic if necessary, I suppose, if not necessarily gothic. That's all for now. I uh, hope you're all staying safe and well during this strange, strange time.
Bye for now.